Hello and welcome to the Lebanese Politics Podcast. My name is Benjamin Red. I'm joined by Temur Asari. Temur, how's it going? I feel good. You know, it's been a it's been a week of uh, up and downs as we've gotten used to. Lots of financial news this week, and uh, I'm I'm very excited to say that we have Omar Tamo here with us this week to discuss it. Omar is a reporter at Lorient today. He focuses on sort of the financial system, on subsidies, on uh, the exchange markets. Uh, he's got. Uh, you know, a lot of insights on Twitter and uh, also can can make us laugh a lot of times. Omar, how's it going? Hello, happy to be here and to join you guys. While well, all is going relatively well, <laughs> considering the things that are happening, lots of financial stuff this week, especially from BDL, like every day since the beginning of the month, they have been going out with new decisions and some of them were contradictory and we will talk about them today for sure. Yeah, we are we're super excited to have you here with us, Omar. To sort of unpack all of the insanity that that seems to have got it. like really this week was just a week full of financial news. Uh, however, there were a few other items, non financial or uh, not totally financial, that we uh, want to hit really quickly before we get to our main discussion. It has been 301 days uh, as of Monday without a government here in Lebanon, uh, 228 days since Hariri was designated to form one. And uh, if you remember, supposedly Nabi Berri was going to come in and sort of mediate talks between Hariri and uh, President Michel Aoun. That seems to have basically gone nowhere, no progress on that. In fact, we, we still had the Hariri camps and the Aoun camp you know, uh, making statements against each other this week. So yet again, we're just frozen. No real news to report on this other than obviously they have not yet formed a government despite things kind of going off the rails. Um, yeah, it's, and it's, it is, yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable, honestly. And at this point, I really, I wouldn't like fault anybody for becoming kind of a cabinet formation truther, uh, you know, really questioning if, if it's actually even a thing, because it, it seems that every couple of weeks we kind of get a, a little bit of movement. We get reports and media that, you know, uh, Nabih Birri has turned on his engines and, and we're gonna, you know, hear something about it soon or that consultations are becoming more intense. Um, and then very quickly it all blows over and uh, we get, uh, it, it usually it ends with a war of statements between the presidency and, and the prime minister's office. And then we don't hear about anything for weeks again. And so, yeah, it's, it's sort of, I mean, you know, when you look at what's happening in the country and you look at the, you know, the lack of sort of enthusiasm, the lack of uh, real, what, it's, what seems like a real attempt to, to come over the obstacles, it's, it's just not there. Yeah, and usually when a mediator steps in, you know, to to mediate things, they have good relations with both sides. And so I, you know, Berri being a very close friend of Michelle Aoun, uh, trusted confidant. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, completely the opposite. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for, for those without the inside knowledge, I mean, Nabih Berri and, and Michelle Aoun have long standing issues and, and recurrent sort of issues. And, and yeah, I, I agree. It's a bit strange to have Nabih Berri mediating when he's clearly on one side. I mean, he's clearly on Hariri's side. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, I mean, re, there was never any reason really to expect a whole lot out of this anyway i at least in my view um and and so far we have not seen anything no. so uh so yeah three 301 days and counting in other news uh we had this this week uh interesting case in the courts we had six women uh press the first charges under lebanon's sexual harassment law it's a new law that was passed in december it was the first of its kind criminalized sexual harassment in the country um, and, and we saw uh, six women press charges in court against a journalist and film director. His name is Jafar Lattar. Uh, it's seen by many as a kind of test case for, for this law. And also some people are pointing to this moment as a bit of a Me Too moment in Lebanon. We had over a dozen women actually speaking about this. Uh, six have pressed charges so far. We will be following this case. It's still in the early stages. In other legal news, we had uh, these developments in the in the special tribunal for Lebanon, uh, the the trial that was set up to look into the uh, 2005 assassination of Rafi Hariri, the former prime minister. Uh, and this week, we had a Reuters report that said that the trial was going to run out of money and shut down in July. This is a, an international tribunal that's funded 51% by the international community and 49% per, by Lebanon. Um, and a few days, actually, after that Reuters report saying that the trial would 
uh, shut down in uh, July. We had judges come out and say that it is, quote, futile to start a trial in June, which is highly likely to be terminated in July due to lack of funds. And they basically announced that they're scrapping uh, ongoing cases. So th the case that's ongoing is uh, uh, the trial of Salim Ayash, who was convicted of the assassination of Rafi Hariri. And uh, there are outstanding cases for the attempted assassination of Marwan Hamede and uh, Elias al Mur uh, and uh, the assassination of George Howey between 2004 and 2005. So we basically are looking at this international tribunal, which already is sort of uh, controversial, already uh, justice was long delayed. People were very critical uh, when the verdict actually came out uh, last year in the in the case against uh, uh, Salim Ayash. Um, and, and now we have just, you know, another sort of roadblock and obstacle. We have Lebanon's uh, caretaker, Prime Minister Hassan Diab, appealing for donors to pay uh, so that the trial can keep going. But it's really on rocky ground right now. Right. And I mean, the STL is also, I mean, it's, it's, it's controversial in part because its detractors, at very least, claim that it's a politicized court, essentially, that it's, you know, uh, international uh, foreign powers, especially Western powers coming in um, and using the court basically for their own purposes to, you know, move uh, uh, against uh, the, the Syrian regime or now Hezbollah. And, and of course, an appeal for international funding would only play into that narrative. On the one hand, you have this uh, sort of uh, controversy, and then on the other hand, you still have, no, these were real crimes, and there has to be accountability somehow. Accountability is so difficult in Lebanon, right? It's a thing we see today with the investigation into the Beirut blast. I mean, yesterday was the 10-month uh, you know, 10 month marker point after the blast. And we still have sort of no indication of of any kind of accountability in that case. Um, and so so it's always yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 difficult. Um, there, there were certainly issues with the STL. Uh, but then, you know, people who are supported say, well, it at least it did give us a verdict, right? And in, in the assassination of Rafi Hadidi. Right, right, right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think we can move on a bit to financial news. Uh, and we had this week a, a big uh, update report from the World Bank. It uh, puts these reports out periodically, uh, Lebanon Economic Monitors. Uh, and they said that Lebanon's crisis would, would likely reach the top 10 crises uh, in the past 150 or so years and potentially break into the top three. Which is absolutely yeah. huge. I, I, I mean, just uh, to have the World Bank coming out and and saying, you know, just just the scale of that. I mean, Im imagine, you know, from the mid nineteenth century until today, if Lebanon's crisis is one of the top three or even top ten crises. I mean, that that really is jaw dropping. It is. I mean, you're literally talking there about since 1850, like the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, is is considered to have ended around 1840. So we're talking pretty much, you know, since the establishment of the global capitalist system, as we know it, Lebanon's crisis could be one of the worst, really sort of stunning. I mean, kind of speaks for itself. And, and the important note there, which the World Bank is repeatedly uh, stating is that this is a deliberate crisis. This is man-made. They say that the you know the crisis in Lebanon is similar to what you have in other countries that are you know t ripped apart by war. Um, and in Lebanon, we we obviously we had a war uh, you know uh, several decades back, but but it is peacetime. Um, but the but the scale of the losses and the scale of the destruction in the country in terms of economic destruction is as if uh, the country was at war. It's uh, it really is stunning, and and again they they lay blame on the political leaders uh, for 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 causing this. Uh, yeah, and uh, and and it is it's quite obvious that you know the Lebanon's leaders, policymakers, have not done what they needed to do in order to fix things. I mean, we have known you know for the past year and a half at least that there were huge problems in the financial system. But any <laughs> attempts to fix those, or in some cases even admit that they exist, really have been stymied by uh, by politicians, by regulators, by uh, by people who have a stake in the system. And, and that sort of sets up, I, at least in my view, it, it sets up the conditions for what we saw this week, which was sort of this chaotic mess financially uh that, that right. happened so let's let's walk through really quickly what happened this week so at at the beginning of the week uh the the first of the month on tuesday we 
we found out that a lot of banks were dropping their Lira withdrawal limits. Now, we already had those withdrawal limits, but they were they went way, way lower, right? It was You, you wrote about this, Omar. Yeah. Okay, so basically what's happening is that uh, the central bank is, tr is trying to limit the cash Lira and circulation out outside the central bank. And one of ways to do it is basically to put tight restriction on the Lira withdrawals. Now, what the central bank is now doing has been like throughout like since last month and with the after they unveiled the Syrafa, the BDL's currency exchange uh, platform, they are trying to limit the cash Lira and circulation and they are also trying to kind of protect the Lira value. One of ways to do it was like, this is the latest decision was basically BDL that placed some restrictions on banks' current account at the central bank. So basically, like generally, uh, Lebanese banks get their cash lira from BDL, they withdraw from their current account at BDL. What the central bank did is mm -hmm. basically, let's assume a bank had like a limit of 100 billion lira. What the BDL did was like, just like slash this limit and like went it to around 20 billion lira. And it's there's a huge, huge, like, and sudden drop. Yeah, this is like a huge drop. And then in their turn, basically, the banks, what they did is basically they reflected this drop in the withdrawals to customers. They basically were like, you have some banks, which is like, I want to name like a few of them, which I'll start with BLF. BLF is basically one of the most liquid banks in Lebanon. They have a better financial position than others because they had like a more conservative approach regarding all the decision, regarding all the investments. So they were more liquid than others. They have a better position. They had like dropped the limit from 30 million lira per month, which was one of the highest towards 5 million lira. This is like six mm. times lower. Other wow. banks like yeah. Blom had 25 million. Now it's 15 million. Some banks like uh, like smaller banks where had like 1 million lira withdrawal per day. Now it's half a million lira, which is even less than $50. Per day, so right. you cannot withdraw yeah. in cash. Less, <laughs> you cannot even withdraw fifty dollars in lira, even even if you are receiving a haircut by withdrawing in lira at uh, three nine hundred, while the market is around thirteen thousand five hundred, mm -hmm. you are still losing a lot. But the thing is, like BDL told banks, well, you can withdraw an excess money, but you will then have to withdraw it from your long term deposits, which they earn interest from. The interest is about eight ten percent, and this is basically right now they're kind of like their only source of income this is like their only source of income there's like the interest rate they are getting from bdl so bdl is telling them well if you want to get lira and to pay your customers you have to basically withdraw from these funds you will stop receiving interest rate you will get like discounted value you will lose like your interest income so banks were like you know this is our only source we have like kind of no choice if you want to keep on going and we are going to Right. Keep the keeping it. We're gonna keep receiving those interest income, and then we're gonna just slash depositors' uh, withdrawal limit. So this sort of works on two levels. Uh, you're you're reducing the cash in circulation first off, which you you you've tweeted quite a bit about this sort of hockey stick uh, uh, graph where we can see that the number of notes in circulation just absolutely explodes just in uh, the past year. Yeah, it's like since. Summer 2019, we almost had around 6 trillion lira in circulation. Now we have 39.88 trillion lira in circulation. That's more than six times higher. And so BDL is trying to, like has been trying since like past October. They first placed some restrictions on banks they, because like last October, they did decrease their limit. Now they just slashed it. Yeah. So even right. though they, even all these policies that the central bank is trying to limit the lira and circulation, it has been increasing by one trillion, one point two trillion per uh, month. When if you go back to early two thousand nineteen, it was just like five to six trillion. Like in total, they had lira and circulation. So so yeah. people have been able to withdraw a certain amount of lira, and part of that has been actually uh, lira at three thousand nine hundred, which is the rate given for dollars, right? For dollar accounts, because you can't withdraw in dollars anymore. So that's the creation of the infamous now Lawler, the Lebanese dollar. Um, and then on Tuesday, we had this decision by the Shura Council. Can you explain that a bit, Omar? What happened there? Basically, the Shura Council decided to suspend this withdrawal at 3900, considering it as illegal, even though it has been happening for more than a year now, since uh, they started it in April, when BDL issued Circular 151, which basically allows depositors and like, quote, <laughs> quote, unquote, allow depositor to withdraw at BDL's market rate. They started with 2,600, then it went up to 3,200, then they fixed it at 3,900. 
and depositors right. were able to withdraw their deposits instead of at the, the official exchange rate of uh, 1500 they were able to withdraw at 3900 but they were also receiving haircuts this has been happening since april 2020 and now uh, the shura council just out of nowhere said well this is like illegal they have to suspend it then first we thought that okay this decision came out nothing came from bdl the next this was on tuesday the next day on wednesday Depositor continued on withdrawing at 3900 then like Wednesday night around like 7, uh, 7 8 p.m. Out of nowhere, uh, this, a press release goes out from the central bank where they are saying, well, we have to suspend it. And then everyone panicked like, wait, now we're going to have to. And basically the Shura Council decision was aiming to basically instead of withdrawing at 3900 they were aiming to basically make the withdrawal in dollars. But banks don't have dollars. So when I talked to the central bank spokesperson and he told me, well, they will withdraw at the official rate. So basically what was happening, huh. <laughs> so the goal, which is, the which is, sorry, that's, that's just crazy because what you're basically doing there is, is instead of having a haircut of what, it's like about 70% at the 3,900 yes. rate, then you're having a haircut of like above 80%. Yeah. It's um, 88 or 90% yeah. depends on the market yeah. rate. So, yeah. yeah. So basically now the decision was basically to decrease the losses on depositors <laughs> instead of doing so it did increase the losses on depositors and and yeah. and just to be clear so we're talking about the sure council here which is lebanon's top administrative court and so why why were they even involved well typically when it's a lawsuit that has to do with some sort of governmental decree or decision which bdl circulars they're actually decisions right they're decisions made by the governor so whenever you have a case involving one of these sort of executive actions, it goes through the administrative court system. And that's why the Shura Council issued this sort of uh, preliminary injunction saying, oh, this decision doesn't apply here. Exactly. And uh, so what happened is on Wednesday morning, like the night, literally the next day, the president uh, just called the uh, BDL governor Riyad Salemi and the Shura Council had, they had a meeting like less, less than an hour. And then after the meeting, the central bank governor just goes out and says, well, we're going to revert the suspension and people will go back to withdrawing at 3900. And actually people were sadly happy to know that they can withdraw 3900 and lose 70 percent of their funds instead of losing 90 percent of their funds well yeah because i mean the, the, it, it kind of stayed a mild wave of panic right when bdl came out with that bayan that that notification saying oh we're going to you know comply with the sure council decision uh stop the 3900 rate withdrawals will be at 1500 which by the way the sure council said you should give them the dollars so when people heard this, they like rushed out to it really quickly, forming at night because BDL released that uh, evening, and and then, you know, and then all of a sudden there's this big powwow at Babda Palace. So what's also interesting is banks were lost. You know, like in the morning, I started asking bankers, and I also started asking depositors, how are they withdrawing? You had some banks that were were kept the three nine hundred and withdrawing at it. You have other banks like that suspended this. Some banks like. Uh, we're like, we don't know, like the depositors were going to the bank and like the bank was saying, you know, like, just give us your name and your phone number and we'll contact you later on. Don't do anything. So that was actually happening. So it was like kind of a mess. No one was do, no one knows what to do. The, there was, there was no circular. There was just like a press release. And this is something the governor highlighted when he reverted. He was like, you know, this is not a circular, not a decision. It was just a press release. So therefore they can just revert it out of nowhere. Yeah, it's what's interesting here and what was pointed out by, by people like Nizar Sari, the head of legal agenda, a legal watchdog group, is that you, you basically have clear intervention in the judiciary, right? You have the Shura Council coming out, giving a decision saying that, you know, banks need to stop, uh, the central bank needs to stop dispersing uh, lira at this rate. Uh, then the central bank says it will comply. And then the president just calls up the head of the Shura Council and the central bank governor, uh, has them over at the, the presidential palace, and then they decide, you know, actually... We're, we're not going to do that right now. We're just we're just going to go in a different direction. And, and, and you know, the, the, the court's uh, sort of judgment there is is basically ignored. Yeah, which, which is interesting because the court's judgment was basically, as, as I understand it, at least this part of it was basically, well, banks legally, you owe these depositors dollars. So give them the fucking dollars. Uh, <laughs> it, it goes back to the same yeah. problem that we've been dealing with for like a year and a half. Of, of banks not uh, giving dollars out or, or allowing people to withdraw or at least withdraw as much as uh, they want. And, and, and so when the, the justice system actually does intervene on the subject and say, well, no, legally you need to do this. Uh, no, that that is just reversed within two days uh, based, I guess, on a, some sort of technicality. 
Okay, so so yeah. we had this sort of we we had this thing at the beginning of the week with uh, with withdrawal limits on lira being severely restricted beyond what they had already been uh, prior to this, and then we had this uh, Shura Council decision and the reaction to that, and then the U-turn on that, uh, and then on Friday though we got yet another really big piece of news. BDL came out with another notification, another another ban, not a decision announcing a couple of pretty major things. And one of those was that depositors would start getting uh, cash dollars, $400 per month in dollars, if, if they met certain requirements, uh, as well as another 400 lollars uh, in Lira at the uh, Sarafa exchange rate, which right now is about 12,000. That is one big piece of news in this, uh, in this memo. And the other one was that BDL said that it was going to reduce the reserve requirement. The reserve requirement is what BDL requires, how much money BDL requires banks to hold at BDL, at the central bank for financial stability purposes. Now this had been 15% and Riyad Saleme has been very, very clear about this on multiple occasions. I will not lower this. Um, in fact, he's gone so far as to argue that he couldn't, uh, even though that isn't supported by the law, uh, or at least to suggest that he couldn't. Uh, but uh, a really big uh, about face on this as well. And BDL announced that it would be lowering that reserve requirement. What it? How many? How many dollars? How much cash it requires banks to hold with it, from fifteen percent down to fourteen percent. Yeah, correct. So this this shift from fifteen percent towards fourteen percent is about now it's like a one billion dollars less since the, yeah the numbers work really easy one percent is a billion dollars <laughs> essentially is 15 percent. there's 15 billion in reserves roughly yeah, yeah. exactly so yeah, the, the latest piece. number uh, of reserves that we had is like 15 billion dollars and this is basically the critical threshold which basically this is why it's one of the reasons that the central bank is like postponing or actually delaying the payment of uh, imports because he they are saying well the central bank saying, I don't want to dip into the mandatory reserves. I'm not going to pay for subsidies by dipping into the mandatory reserves. We have now reached 15 billion. This is the mandatory reserves level. I'm not going to touch it. If they want to do this in his last interview with Al Hadath around like two weeks ago, he said like, well, if they want to continue on subsidizing, this has to come from either the cabinet or the parliament. And then out of nowhere, he just goes out and say in a press release, as you said, this is not a decision yet. He says like, we are going to drop it from 15% to 14% beginning July. So a, a big uh, change in policy, right? So the, basically this is – because I, I had always been wondering about this. Like why is uh, why is Riyad Saleme drawing the line here uh, when, you know, that there are other lines that could have been drawn? Why why is it here? Uh, and, and now we see, oh, well – no, he actually could t take this uh, reserve requirement down a bit to free up some dollars. Although now the question is, are those dollars actually freed up and where do they go, right? Because if you're, uh, remember, this is the bank's money, ultimately depositors' money, but uh, the banks place this money at BDL uh, as part of like a, you know, this this requirement is 15%. Now that 1%, they don't have to place there anymore. So if I'm a bank, I'm going to tell BDL, I want my dollars back. Exactly what the banks are doing. They have been also always, they have been doing so for the last like four or five months. They're saying, well, if you want to touch the mandatory level or you want to free it up, you have to give us back our dollars, which are... Which the legally, dollars. they're in the right about this, right? Of course, this is like basically, I mean... Basically, all these are depositors' money and they are the commercial banks that placed it there. But the thing is, the difference between the mandatory reserves and the other reserves, like one of them, the mandatory is like they were, they had to place it at BDL. The other part was like they placed it there to get like excessive interest rate income. You know, right. so that's the difference. So therefore, they were like saying, so they did put this like kind of limit where if you want to touch the mandatory level, you have to give it back. You have to give back our money. It's yeah, it's it's really interesting to sort of, I mean, we we don't really know what the deal is here, right? You're so you're freeing up a billion dollars. We know that uh, there's there's continuous demand on subsidies, and we know that Riyad Salemi has also uh, you know been doing interviews and has you know he's facing various legal challenges. He does have a legacy to maintain, right? And I think that especially here with the with the uh, with the depositors being able to withdraw four hundred dollars and then an extra four hundred uh, you know in in lira at the market rate. 
he has said repeatedly in interviews when asked about depositors' money, he would say, you know, it's still there and it's with the it's with the commercial banks. Um, and here he is basically saying, like, yeah, look, I mean, look, I, I I was right the whole time. I'm now telling you, you can go and withdraw your dollars. Uh, you can't withdraw them all, but slowly, slowly, you can withdraw the dollars. And what's interesting here is that the banks, even before this was released, had said we can't pay out a single dollar. Um, and so it's it seems as I mean, what Dan as he called it is very simply you pay no you pay yeah exactly and what's funny in the press release like bdl says like the first year the payment will be done through banks money which is held at correspondent bank abroad and basically he's saying well banks have about 1 billion to 1.2 billion abroad so they can use these funds and then like uh, he also sa says that there is like uh, you can also use this kind of special money they we are not sure if they were able to recoup it or not yet, because basically back in August, BDL issued Circular 154 when they were asking banks basically to bring back 3% of their total deposits, place it in correspondent banks abroad. These banks will be basically recouped from those who transferred more than $500,000 since July 2017. Uh, these, these depositors who transferred more than $500,000 have to bring back 15% of that money and if they are like politically connected or if they are like bank shareholders or directors they have to bring back 30% we are still unsure hmm. if banks were able to bring back that money I spoke to ABL spokesperson they were unable to confirm it they still don't know yet uh, some major bankers I asked them too they told us well maybe some banks did others didn't so we still unsure if they can do so if they brought the money but the thing is the special thing about these funds they were brought back to be deposited at commercial banks abroad to basically boost the economy when needed basically for investment and the other thing is like banks in this the same circular bdl tells banks well you have to guarantee that you will give back the money in five years so if they will use mm. these funds then they can they won't be able to give it back in five years if they're going to give it to that depositor and not investment then they won't the, the money won't be returned so they won't be able to give it back to their initial depositors so in this mm. press release bdl tells them well you can use those three percent too from the other hand, banks were like, no, we don't want to use this money because we have to give it back to customers. And regarding the one to one point two billion dollars they have abroad, uh, Salim Sfer, who is the chairman of Bank of Beirut and the Association of Banks in Lebanon, previously said like, well, we may have dollars abroad, but our net foreign assets, which is basically their net position between how much dollars they have and how much dollars they owe is actually negative. So basically their position is like minus 1.7 billion. They own more money than they have. So they cannot use their own money. This will make them more bankrupt than they are, technically speaking. And ABL like sent uh, a day before this press release, sent a letter to the governor, to BDL's governor. And they told them, if you want to pay the $400 because you have to basically use the mandatory reserves. We don't have money abroad to use. And just to keep, just to go back in the background a bit, like this decision didn't come out of nowhere. They have been they talks about it since May. They have been talking since early May. They have been talking about it. The plan was in the beginning, we give back $20,000 in, in real dollars, another $25,000 in at the market rate, Sarafa's rate in three years that's what the plan so basically they give back to depositors fifty thousand dollars that was the plan in the beginning and now through time they have been developed it and they basically now announced it will be four hundred dollars per month over i mean they didn't they didn't mention the time frame yet uh, they said that they will issue a circular later on with more details but so the decision will be now four hundred dollars in dollars and another four hundred at the market rate and so if you're a, a bank, the real question is, well, where do I get these dollars from? There's the notification that BDL issued on Friday said, oh, for the first year, you should pay out these $400 per month, you know, using these this money from abroad. So if you're a bank, you know, maybe, maybe you have enough dollars to do that. Maybe not, probably not uh, overall throughout the banking sector. And so then you're saying, well, now, Riyadh, you're lowering the reserve requirement, so give me my dollars so that I can follow through with this plan that you want me to do. Uh, but there's a question here as to whether that's actually going to happen, right? Riyadh Saleme could give this money back to banks in dollars, or he could give the money in lira at a certain exchange rate, maybe the Sairafa rate. And, and then, because Saleme also has to think about 
the subsidies, which have not been reformed. There's been no real movement on this. And if they uh, if they cut subsidies uh, more than they apparently have been, uh, we could see even greater blackouts, even longer lines at, at gas stations. You, you have to buy medicines for hospitals. There are certain things that are just like very basic things that uh, would lead to an absolute calamity if BDL suddenly stopped paying for. Right. It's exactly. all coming out of the same pot. Uh, and, and, and the idea is you have to, you know, how does that get managed? Um, and, and, you know, you have talk of the of the uh, ration card that Hassan Diab would cost around 1.2 billion. The current subsidy program costs apparently around five to six billion a year with a lot of waste there by the admission of, uh, you know, former ministers and, and people in government. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the issue really becomes how do you use these last 15 billion, uh, the, you know, and, and now a billion of those are free. What do you do with that? How do you use it? Yeah. yeah. Do you give it to depositors or do you buy subsidies with it or do you buy essential goods with it? Yeah. yeah. The press release doesn't basically say that, it, that the central bank will use this money to fund uh, depositors. They just say, well, we're going to cut it by 1%. And the interesting also part is like, the central bank can also give them back in dollars at 12,000. You know, like mm -hmm. we'll tell you, okay, I will free it up to you. I will give you the dollars at the exchange rate of 12,000. And so you can give them at the market rate. So just give them, he will exchange it and give it them to Lira and he will keep his dollars in like real dollars at the central bank and he will give them and he will decrease the mandatory. He will decrease the balance with them by giving them, by exchanging the dollars to Lira at the market rate and then he will give them to, to them and they will t and he will tell them well we did contribute with the half of it and the, in the talks that is that are happening between the central bank and the commercial banks which several major bankers told me they have they are like the central bank kind of assured them that he's gonna pay 50 percent of it but he did not tell them the 50 percent is the dollar part he just tell them yeah. we're gonna contribute by 50 percent and there is like and there's also like a lack of trust between like it was just a verbal kind of assurement where he's guaranteed it's a verbal guarantee and uh, so they they really do not know yet what's happening and the mechanism isn't in place the mechanism is still not uh, there yet they we have like less than a month where they, because they they said they will start doing it in early july so it's still like unclear the source of funds how it's gonna be done who's gonna get the money this is also very interesting because they say it's not that every depositor can get the money it's like they said that depositors who had money before october 17 2019 they will get them they will be able to withdraw 400 dollars but the trick part is that uh, most at least small depositors did withdraw the money they had before october 17 either in dollars in the beginning or they were able to withdraw it at the market rate in Lira and they got a haircut. And uh, basically, if you had, for example, let's assume $20,000 back in October uh, 2019, you most probably withdrew that money to just consume and live. Mm. So basically, these people won't get a penny in dollars, you know, and uh, who will be able to get it is basically those who are like a medium or larger depositors who these guys will be able to get it in dollars. And the other part is like this kind of decision, you know, like because the central bank says that this like decision to give 400 in dollars and 400 in lira will increase the lira in circulation by about 27 trillion lira, which sure. this will put lots of pressure on the lira market rate. And if you imagine what will happen, like everyone will withdraw the lira and the, the consumption will increase in lira. But those who did withdraw the dollars, no one is going to use the dollar and exchange it. They will all put it aside obviously we'll use the lira to consume this will put a lot of pressure on the lira value you're increasing the lira in circulation which is already sky high which is the beginning of the week we we talked about how they were lowering how much people could actually take out in lira so it's like one policy is it's like they're they're pushing on the brake and right. on the gas yeah. at the same time sort of it it feels I like I mean, Ahmad, I'm interested in your analysis a bit here in, in terms of what do you think the, the, the governor of BDL is actually getting at? Because, you know, if we, if we go back about a year to the to when, uh, you know, Hassan Diab's financial rescue plan was was passed, 
we saw that the central bank was one of the main players that fought that plan. Uh, they fought against, you know, the assessment of the losses and the way that it, it would be dealt with. And now w what we seem to be seeing is a continued piecemeal approach. I mean, it's almost as if this decision aims to remove pressure because in the no in the notice that the central bank released, they basically said that within a year, they estimate that 800,000 depositor depositors would have closed their accounts. Uh, and they say that's the majority of, of, of accounts. Um, and, and so... It, it seems like almost the central bank is in a way uh, keen on, on getting a large amount of people out of the banking system rather than reforming it. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, there have been everyone was trying, I mean, to fight this like financial recovery plan, which is basically aims to reform both the banking sector and the public sector. Basically, the plan was like aiming to fix the losses at the central bank and at the commercial banks. And everyone faulted from starting with the central bank governor, the parliament's finance and budget committee and ABL. Now, what the central bank governor is doing, there's, he's doing lots of stuff. One of them is like saying, well, he's been always saying your money isn't gone. It's still available. And now he's basically proving to people this is one thing that he's doing. And he's like telling them, I told you your money is here and now you are going to get paid back. So we're going to give you back your money. We are not bankrupt. The money is there. And even though it isn't, <laughs> <laughs> right. the money, I mean, <laughs> the money is there. That's the thing. We are, we are gonna it's pay Schrodinger's back. money, Schrodinger's dollar. <laughs> yeah. So, and the thing is, like, that's the question is, like, can they even do it? Like, I've been talking to many people and have been assessing it. Like, most banks cannot do it. Like, they might last like a month or two or maybe three. And then later on, it will be like, I don't have dollars anymore to give people. So, what should I do? Like, uh, and then, like, this, I mean, this needs a huge study they need to assess it has lots of implications like how which banks can continue which banks cannot continue you cannot just say oh all the bank as a whole have uh, 1.2 billion this does not mean each bank has like 10 uh, percent of the deposits in dollars some banks might have a lot more just like i was saying like uh, like there are some liquid banks who have a better position other banks that might have nothing abroad you know so in this case they need to assess this you need to also assess the risk on the exchange rate which surely isn't done he just told you yeah we're gonna throw 27 trillion lira in circulation i don't know exactly what he's doing and i'm not even sure this is like this is literally a populist decision we need a holistic plan that basically fixes the issues that fixes the roots this does not fix the roots at all see i i, I wonder though is is this really a a populist plan though right because if if there aren't enough dollars to go around, well, we know what that means. We means that certain people get preferential treatment. Usually the richer clients, the, ba the banks want to appease them first. So if there are limited dollars to go around, then they're gonna be first in line, most likely to uh, make use of this. And, and then just sort of like going up the chain a level as well, as far as I understand it, there is, a, we were talking about whether uh, BDL is going to pay banks this 1% of their reserves uh, in lira or dollars. As far as I understand it, there is nothing that requires BDL to treat all banks the same, uh, or or very least in practice, it seems as though he could favor certain banks uh, and disfavor others if he, if he wanted to. And so right. there's this entire chain of, uh, that makes me quite, you know, where I just really don't have a whole lot of trust either in, you know, the, the people leading the banks or the people, you know, leading the financial system to actually make sure that this money goes to the people who need it the most. So I, I wonder if it is, just, I mean, it sounds good and populist and everything, but in practice, is this just another way for people who are relatively well off to be better well off or people with the right political connections of course like first of all like we don't have a capital control law so basically you can easily give someone like an amount bigger than the other no one can see it. there's backing security also from the bdl side to banks connection you can prefer like uh, bank x and like give them dollars because they are connected they had deals together this is kind of like the financial engineering that happened in 2016 like all banks did kind of uh, benefit from it but there are certain banks who clearly did benefit a lot more than others like sgbl got a whole lot that was sort of like outsized to their you know relative size within the banking sector for instance yeah you have also bank audi and bank med who got saved like from their investments and you also 
of Blum Bank. So these like benefited the most, their size increased the most compared to other smaller banks who did benefit from it. But if you compare the percentage increase inside or or in profit, you can clearly see that oh, wait, these banks had like after the financial engineer just suddenly grew and the others like just had like some tiny improvement. Right. So this can happen again. Discretion. And 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 just to be clear, we we don't know the reasons why for this, right? Like we're, uh, it it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that there was any sort of malintent or anything, or that the, these things were done with Wasta. But because we don't know the methodology by which the financial engineering was done and and these allocations were made, we 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 just don't know. What I'm interested in, Omar, is you know, as someone who follows things very closely, and I think what what a lot of people care about is you know, we we have indications now that. The central bank, you know, it's lowered the mandatory minimum in, in foreign currency. It's freeing up a, an extra billion dollars to to use for whatever it's going to use it on. As you said, we don't have transparency on that. As someone who follows this uh, collapse closely, can you take us to sort of where you think we're going over the next few months in terms of subsidies on, uh, you know, medicine, which we've already seen sort of uh, being uh, lifted or at least raised uh, slightly uh, on fuel and on on wheat, on the essentials? Uh, how does how does the roadmap look for the next few months? Are we in for a, a difficult summer? I mean, looking at things, how they are going, the central bank has been delaying payments for all, from, for all sectors. Like if we look at the medicine sector, like uh, about 10 days ago, the central bank said, we are going to, I mean, the health ministry said that the central bank promised medicine importers they will pay $180 million and they haven't done so. If you look at the food importers, they have placed lira to get dollars at the central bank about three months ago and the value is about $20 million and the they didn't get the dollars yet. So you have also, you have here the medicine, you have the food importers. If you look at the electricity du Liban, the electricity supplier in Lebanon, they had like four barges, uh, they were supposed to be paid. The value is about $62 million. And uh, so last week, uh, the electricity de Lebanon went out and said, well, we were only able to unload one cargo and the rest we cannot unload it because the central bank did not pay. So basically, it seems like the central bank is delaying all payment. And this is like basically reflecting as if the subsidies were indirectly removed because they are not paying for anything, as it seems like this is what right. all the- Or at least not paying at the same you know, rate, like they they may be delaying payments a bit more. Like they're, they're, we still do have electricity, for instance, but it's just the power cuts have gotten worse and worse over time. Yeah, exactly. Like as we were saying, like instead of unloading four, you just unloaded one cargo. So basically you have now 75% less electricity and we already didn't have four 24 hours electricity before. So now in Beirut, for example, we barely have electricity for like, what, five, six hours at best. I mean, at my place, this is what we are having. And this is like, we went from like 20 hours electricity towards now five hours of electricity. Where we are going is like, uh, seems like there's a lot of uncertainty. And now with this decision, we don't know how it's gonna be implemented, what they are gonna do, but we are clearly heading like, I mean, that's one of the issues. And this is what the World Bank reflected, like policymakers and the lawmakers aren't doing anything. They're literally silent and going through like the laissez faire. Hassan Diab is like the caretaker prime minister is like, well, I'm not going to do anything regarding subsidies. Parliament are not taking any decision. They just like wrote like some quick retargeting subsidy plans, which are like include lots of mistakes and they are missing a lot of stuff, which I believe like uh, it will never be in place. And the central bank is saying, well, I'm not going to remove subsidies. This has to come from the cabinet of parliament. No one wants to take a decision. No one wants to be blamed for removing subsidies. And now we have reached the required reserves. Is the central bank going to use this one billion to fund subsidies or is it going to use it to pay the depositors? We still don't know, but we are heading towards a tough summer. And like if even the expats don't know if they want to come to Lebanon or not, like uh, many are talking to me and they are just telling us, uh, well, we don't know if we're gonna come to Lebanon. We're not gonna come and stay in line like two hours at the gas station to fill our cars. We don't wanna come and stay like without electric, without power, without like uh, medicine. There's also this a huge problem in the health sector. So things are going, I mean, we're going from bad to worse to even worse. And I can't see any positive thing happening from now to like a month or two. So unfortunately I have to say this, like we are going towards like, as the president said, maybe hell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, I mean, for yeah. for me, it's we we've known, you know, for a couple of years now, almost that like things were headed over a cliff, but we never actually head over a cliff. It is just like this slow decline, right? And and ever ever so slowly, we just keep getting 
suffocated more and more and more, but there ever there isn't this like moment of oh okay, chalas, uh, everything's going to shit suddenly. It's just it, it's like it's sort of the frog in boiling water. Uh, I, I I feel a, a bit, uh, and and going forward, if we if we look forward, it seems as though oh well maybe it's going to continue the same way because I mean. 14% can be brought down to 13% and then 12 and just this very slow strangulation of the economy while keeping a minimum level of subsidies that just keeps getting smaller and smaller. Uh, but at the same time, we have things like this week and a decision from the judiciary that throws a massive spanner in the works that all of a sudden, because policymakers never actually fixed anything, causes a huge problem that shouldn't have ever existed in the first yeah. place if if they had been doing their jobs. And so I, I sort of see both sides of the coin where maybe we, you know, it is a very slow descent to hell, but at the same time, there could be these sort of like weeks of chaos where something unexpected happens because nobody's fixed anything. Yeah, maybe like it right. can be just one kind of small event that can cause chaos in Lebanon, you know, like happening slowly as you have been saying, but people like and kind of like you know if they do it slowly they will like be able to tolerate it more which is even though it's not tolerable at all like life here in Lebanon is becoming like really really hard and it's becoming messy but yeah they're doing it slowly and slowly yeah so so from both of your statements I basically <laughs> the the summary there seems to be like things are going to continue to steadily decline and maybe we're going to get thrown a curveball that'll expedite the decline am i right in that yeah sadly that's it i mean it, it seems to be the case that's that's what we're yeah. seeing already well i i'm certainly happy that we we have uh people like uh, like you Omar, who are chronicling this day in day out it's a difficult task it's a task that i'm sure weighs on you a lot and and you know we we really do appreciate uh your your writing and and your stuff on twitter um, please do keep letting us know what's happening uh, behind the scenes in the central bank and ABL. Um, so we'll be back soon with another episode. Uh, until then, I'm Taymur Azhari. I'm Benjamin Red. I'm Omar Tamu. And this has been the Lebanese Politics Podcast. Politics Podcast is brought to you by myself, Nizar Hassan, Benjamin Red, produced behind the scenes by Susan Wilson, and the music is by Omar Elfil.